Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wondered whether there's more to the world than meets the eye, or more than science is letting on, then do we have the One Mind Show for you. Today I'll be talking with Dr. Larry Dossey, an internal medicine physician and the former chief of staff of Medical City Dallas Hospital. He's the author of the New York Times bestseller, Healing Words, and 11 other books, and a new personal favorite of mine, or consciousness favorite of mine, One Mind. And that's what we'll be talking about today, about how our individual mind is part of a greater consciousness and why it matters. That plus we'll talk about coyotes and bobcats, mass units and helicopter crashes, cosmic soup and frothy fractal boundaries, bison on the plains, Bobby the Collie, what in the world happened at Evans Corner Drug, and why God won't let <laughs> won't drive flies away from a tailless cow. <laughs> gotcha. So welcome to the show, Harry. Are you ready to shine? That's quite an intro, uh, Michael. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I'm ready to roll. All right. And a mighty woohoo for having you on the show. So Great. before we dive right into things, I've got to ask, what initially drew you to the concept of one mind? Well, as they say, I was sort of drug kicking and screaming uh, into thinking deeply about this idea. Uh, for one thing, I uh, was... Uh, faced with some what we call precognitive dreams, mm -hmm. dreams of future events during my first year of uh, practice of internal medicine in Dallas, Texas, uh, many years ago. Uh, I knew that you could not see the future. You couldn't experience things before they happened. None of this made any sense. But uh, what happened was that I had some very vivid dreams, what I would call one of the most uh, vivid dreams in my life. I dreamt of a very complex clinical event that would play out the next day. Uh, and when it actually did happen, I was absolutely, absolutely unnerved. I, I found this very upsetting because I was a typical uh, physician. I'd been trained to know uh, with beyond any doubt that things unfolded sequentially. Uh, you couldn't uh, apprehend or know things before they happened. But there it was. I was faced with two more of those experiences within about a month, and by the time uh, this had ended, I knew that I had to reevaluate my worldview. Things obviously were playing out in ways that I had considered impossible. You know, I, it's hard to turn away from those sorts of things when they hit you in the face like that. Uh, I did not shy away from them. Uh, I embraced them and I began to educate myself about other ways of uh, thinking about the uh, role of time and space in our lives. And so that's the short version. So if, if I pull on the thread of the, the, the sweater of, of your past view of consciousness, you had kind of an early seed, which I think predisposed you to looking at things a little differently or a little non-local, which is a twin brother. Exactly. You know, I'm glad you brought up this term non-local because uh, this is central to uh, the way experiments are playing out these days in a field called consciousness research. Uh, for our listeners and viewers, I, I think it's just helpful to say that non-local is just a fancy word for infinite. And if uh, they hear us using that term with respect to the mind, uh, then they may know that non-local mind is just what we mean by infinite mind. And if mind is infinite in space, then it's everywhere in space. It's omnipresent. And if uh, mind is infinite in time, it's everywhere in time, meaning that it's immortal and it's eternal. So uh, this may sound like a complicated concept for people, this non-local mind stuff. Mm -hmm. But really, it's fairly simple when you boil it down to uh, its basic elements. So would you mind, I'm, I'm very happy for that clarification, would you mind if we went back a little bit and understood a little bit of the relationship and you and your twin brother and how that planted a seed? Well, there uh, is a, uh, an area of research that has been going on for about 30 years called uh, telesomatic events. Uh, this is a term that in Latin means just the distant body. Uh, this was relevant to me because I am an identical twin, and my brother and I obviously have distant bodies, 
But where this gets to be very interesting is that we have long shared feelings, uh, even physical symptoms at a distance, as if there's only one body that's feeling them, but we both sense them, we apprehend them. Again, Michael, this is supposed to not be possible. You know, this has become even more personal to me because I'm married to a twin. Mm -hmm. And my wife, Barbara, and her fraternal twin have had these experiences uh, all of their life. You know, my brother and I, growing up as young boys, we didn't know that this stuff was not supposed to happen. And we just took it uh, for granted. It was just the way the world worked. We call this uh, twin stuff. Mm-hmm. And, and twin stuff was shared feelings, shared thoughts, and so on. And uh, since uh, my brother and I stumbled into this in, our, in growing up, uh, this field actually has uh, flowered experimentally. There are all sorts of studies now that uh, have been done in identical twins, and we know that about 30% of identical twins experience these simultaneous feelings and thoughts and so on at a great distance. So this is not just peculiar to my brother uh, and me. Uh, this has been looked at experimentally. So uh, let's go from there. We'll go to, uh, thank you for sharing on that. We'll go to the beginning of the book because it kind of touched a chord in my own personal life, which is if I want, if I want signs and guidance from what I call the universe, I go mm-hmm. outside and I tend to get them from the animals here, there, or elsewhere. I rescued or she rescued me, uh, a coyote from the Navajo reservation who became my my 17-year lifelong companion. And I guess some coyotes were in your life right before this book came out as well. Well, uh, (laughs) I'm glad to hear your experience with with coyotes. Uh, They've played a role in this book. Uh, You know, I, I live in northern New Mexico, and there are a lot of coyotes out in nature here. And uh, I've lived in uh, our house for uh, about 25 years, Mm -hmm. and I experienced something new that had never occurred before when I was writing a book, writing a chapter in this book about communing with animals via the one mind. And I was crafting this chapter. Coyotes began to come up to the window of my study and look in. And first there was one, but uh, eventually there were three uh, who would come and I didn't, didn't know what to make of this. And then I thought, it seems like they're listening in as I'm writing this chapter about the communion between humans and animals mm-hmm. via the one mind. I actually, <laughs> I actually thought that they'd come to check up on me and make sure I got it right. Uh, and I still find that a pleasing thought. But uh, this had never happened before. And after I finished crafting that chapter, They disappeared, and they have never come back. So this could be just one of those things, coincidences, you know, as skeptics like to say. But for me, it had deeper meaning. I I can see that. So let's let's talk about chapter one in the book. You talk about Wesley Autry, January 2nd, 2007, uh, doing something that most of us would never dare dream or think about doing. Well, Wesley Autry was a 50-year-old Navy veteran who did carpenter work in uh, New York City. And he was going to work one day and was standing on a subway platform when he saw a young, young man about 20 years old have a, uh, an epileptic seizure. And this young man fell off the subway platform onto the tracks. Uh, and uh, Autry did something instinctively. He jumped onto the tracks with the man and tried to lift him back up onto the platform, but he was too heavy. He couldn't manage it. And so here comes a subway train. And it's clear to Autry that if he abandons this young man, he's going to get crushed and killed and run over by the subway. So what Autry did was to put him in between the rails and the little depression between the subway rails and cover him with his own body. Uh, The subway train could not stop in time and three cars passed over these two men before they could bring the train to a halt Uh, overnight and i'm sure some uh, listeners will uh, remember this this became headlines and the next morning this guy appeared on the major talk shows on television but uh, the question was from everyone why in the world would you risk your life you're a black man he's a white man 
uh, why would you give your life for somebody you've never met, you'll probably never see again in your life? And he said, well, I just thought it was the right thing to do. There was no hesitation at all. I, I was stunned by this. One of the reasons I was uh, captivated was that this matched up with some of my experiences as a field battalion surgeon uh, in Vietnam in 1968 and 1969. I was actually faced with uh, situations like this, Michael. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them uh, with which I related Wesley Alter's experience uh, with was when a helicopter crashed uh, uh, close to my battalion aid station out in the field. And uh, as you, the usual thing is that the helicopter explodes and the pilots killed and burned up. Well, without thinking, uh, I rushed into this downed helicopter scene with one of my medics and uh, without thinking, without any hesitation, cut this pilot from the seat straps and drug him away from the helicopter. Uh, fortunately, the thing did not explode, but I was faced with questioning my own sanity. I, I had no idea why I would do that. You know, biologists tell us that we're supposed to never risk our lives to save someone who isn't in our close kin group. We're supposed to, you know, perpetuate our own genes. And saving somebody you've never met is not exactly the best way to do that. So after I be came back from Vietnam and began to think about that, I came across a description by the mythologist Joseph Campbell, who said in describing heroic events of that sort, he said, it is totally irrational for people to do that. The only reason they do is that at the decisive moment, when they risk their life for the person, these two people are so fused, so united and integrated in their consciousness that there's not a question of this guy rescuing this person because they are not two people. These people are united at a level of consciousness so intimately that there really, really is only one mind operating in those moments so that the person who is doing the heroic action is not rescuing someone else. Essentially, he's rescuing himself because of the fusion of consciousness. Well, from my own experience, I thought this explains exactly why I did that. And I felt, you know, sometimes you're faced with an explanation. You know immediately that there's truth in it. This was my feeling about uh, Campbell's explanation for these sorts of events. And I think that was exactly what was happening when Wesley Autry leaped in the subway uh, tracks and uh, covered this young man with his body and essentially saved him. You, you just hit a nerve with me because my first, I've had two near-death experiences, and the first one was on rollerblades when a, a, a father teaching his baby how to walk stepped out in front of me on a bike path. He didn't know it was a bike path. And I somehow threw myself up and backwards to stop myself from hitting the baby. Yes. I did not think about hitting, I, I spoken about it in the past as if it's a conscious decision. There was no decision. It was in, y y it can't be instinctive because instinctive, well, it's just such a mind bender because it, it blurs everything is the best way to describe it. It completely yep. blurs and you're doing something without even know you're going to do it. Right. Well, I think that's exactly right. And if you look at uh, events where individuals get rescued. This is not confined to human beings. I collected a whole bunch of stories that went into this chapter in the book, and I found that people would perform like this in rescuing animals that were drowning or animals in trouble. I have a bunch of stories where animals actually do the same thing to other animals. And uh, there are all sorts of uh, stories out there where animals do this in rescuing humans. Uh, these things are so common, these stories usually don't even get reported anymore, but there's a huge backlog in them, and I think the same dynamic is working in all possible combinations. I think this is indirect evidence for the operation of a unified consciousness, which under certain situations, there are no boundaries between individuals. The boundaries go away, and we are connected on certain uh, levels of consciousness. What can we learn from Schrodinger? Well, you know, we, we to all shift have gears our, radically here. 
Yes, I'm glad you bring up uh, Erwin Schrodinger, uh, one of the great physicists of the 20th century. He was awarded the Nobel Prize in physics in 1933 for what we today call the Schrodinger wave equations, which lie at the heart of modern quantum physics. Actually, he's a hero of mine because he was one of the most prominent scientists in the 20th century who endorsed the concept of the one mind. He just flat out said in his writings, the idea of multiple minds is an illusion. He said, in truth, there is only one mind. I don't think you can put it any more forceful than that. I'm interested in his views because a lot of people say this idea of uh, of one mind is just something that, you know, California hippies thought up back in the 80s or 70s, and no good scientist would ever, ever endorse this crazy idea. Well, that's just simply wrong. He was one of the most prominent scientists, uh, physicists in world history, and he came out emphatically and without reservations for this idea of the one mind. I must uh, add also that he's not the only physicist who went in this direction. More recently, David Bohm, the great uh, physicist, also endorsed this idea that there is a common consciousness and only one mind existing among people. And he went so far as to say that if we don't see this, it's only because we are blinding ourselves to it. What would Einstein have said? <laughs> well, Einstein had this idea that uh, uh, consciousness... Uh, it does make tremendous differences in terms of unity between people. Uh, he certainly was of the idea that we need to get over this idea of the other, someone who is different from us, who doesn't share our worldview, our religion, our spiritual views, and so on. He was not so emphatic, however, as Schrodinger and uh, Bohm, but uh, uh, he was in the ballpark, I'll say. Yeah, from what I understand, spooky at a distance, spooky action at a distance drove him insane. Conversely, <laughs> he was the first to say that his ideas didn't come with words attached. That's right. No, he said uh, that intuition is more important than knowledge, by which he meant that he gets ideas that uh, aren't rational uh, and, and certainly aren't uh, uh, they don't f conform to common sense. Everybody knows uh, that now who's dipped into quantum physics or relativity. So he was of the, ide of the idea and the persuasion, I think, that there is a way of gaining information that bypasses reason, intellect, and logic. But he did not develop this idea to the extent that Schrodinger, Bohm, and other physicists did. What's it mean that there's no out there out there? <laughs> well, I uh, am, of the, am, am, am of the persuasion that the out there, uh, which we refer to as the external world, uh, made up of particles and material stuff, uh, basically is preceded by an act of consciousness. Now, I think consciousness is fundamental. I don't think that it's made or produced by the brain, uh, which uh, most materialistic scientists uh, say these days. And uh, I look uh, for affirmation also in the terms of uh, great scientists who have held this view. I think it comes as a shock to a lot of people to uh, recognize that the founder of quantum physics, Max Planck, uh, actually came out publicly in favor of the idea that consciousness precedes matter. Matter is a function of consciousness. It isn't the other way around, as uh, modern scientists, for the most part, say. So uh, Planck and later Schrodinger, affirming this view, said that consciousness is fundamental. Planck said, you cannot get behind consciousness. There's nothing that precedes it. Matter doesn't make it. So I think that uh, it's important to look at uh, the views of these incredibly influential physicists. For the most part, they've been shoved aside and viewed with embarrassment by a lot of current scientists. But I think we do need to go back and see what a lot of the founding physicists in the 20th century had to say about the nature of consciousness. What would they, this, this is going to be the question to ask the fish about the fishbowl, 
how would they define consciousness? <laughs> well, I follow a uh, definition of consciousness that uh, uh, separates it from what we call mind. Mm -hmm. uh, I think consciousness is an overarching principle that no one has been able to adequately define when we get right down to it. Consciousness is something that makes awareness possible. It has no specific content. Stuff, the mental things that we refer to as thoughts, feelings, attitudes, and so on, is the, the production of mental activities mm -hmm. uh, that arise uh, largely from the way the brain works. But I want to emphasize that the basic concept of non-local awareness, non-local mind, is that it isn't a function of the brain. The brain doesn't make consciousness. Uh, a metaphor, I think, that sort of captures these distinctions between consciousness and mind uh, is that of a movie projector. Mm -hmm. Consciousness is like the light that is transmitted through the projector Whereas mind is like the film that has images and stuff encoded on it. And so without the light, you don't have any stuff of the, uh, that's projected out of the, uh, the uh, movie projector. So consciousness is analogous to the light that passes through, where mind is, the, uh, an, is an analogy of uh, stuff that gets projected by virtue of the fact that consciousness affects the film. So then is the brain what allows us to see the film and then limit our interpretation of the film? Absolutely. That's a great way to put it. Uh, in my view, the brain modifies and transmits and uh, actually distorts in many uh, cases uh, our emotions, attitudes, and so on. Everything that we think isn't valid. We think up illusions as well as truthful things. But the key point is that uh, thoughts, feelings, and so on are the products of brain activity, chemistry, physiology, anatomy, and so on. But beyond that is this fundamental nature of consciousness that makes the whole show go on. Now, many people will recognize that this view of consciousness has a very Eastern flavor uh, in Taoism and Buddhism, it's not uncommon to find people talking the same way about consciousness as we're talking here. Consciousness is fundamental. It's uh, what makes awareness and the stuff of the mind possible. I want to dive in a minute into, uh, into some animals some more because it's so much fun. But before that, <laughs> can you tell us about entanglement and what that has to do with anything? Entanglement was a term actually coined by... Uh, uh, our hero, Erwin Ir Schrodinger, back in the, uh, the early part of the 20th century. And it had to do with uh, the, the implications of quantum mechanics. Uh, everyone probably has heard about the uh, findings that if you have particles which are once in contact with one another, and then you separate them at arbitrarily dis arbitrary distances, even to the opposite ends of the universe, when you change one, the other changes instantly at the same time in the same degree. Now, this it was called spooky action at a distance, and it horrified Einstein, as you've already mentioned. But Schrodinger went with this idea, and he said these two particles separated in space are entangled. Uh, this is a very graphic term which has stuck in modern physics. Now the reason we should be interested in it in talking about consciousness is that there are some corollaries between how people behave at a distance and how these distant particles behave. It appears that uh, people can be entangled in the same sense that distant separated particles can be uh, uh, entangled. For example, People can share thoughts when separated at maximal distances mm -hmm. on the earth. This has been shown, I think, beyond dispute in a field of research called remote viewing. Uh, people routinely have spontaneous experiences at a distance with a distant individual who is emotionally close with them. We've already mentioned how this operates in identical twins, but it also operates between non-twins who are 
emotionally connected with one another deeply uh, when they are at a distance. And so one wonders, is there con any connection between entangled particles and entangled people? Well, a lot of people want to make that uh, connection and say that people get entangled because of their particles being entangled. I think there's no evidence for that currently. It may turn out that you can explain human entanglement through entangled quantum particles, but that's too early to say. The fact is that people are entangled for reasons that aren't clear, uh, and this uh, is one of the background ways of thinking about how one mind operates. I think we've all had the experience of thinking of somebody and then they email or the phone rings and we know who it is before they pick it up and we just kind of poo-poo it. Oh, well, yeah, that's a funny coincidence. I thought it was <laughs> going to be John calling. I haven't spoken to him in 15 years. So what, what are a thick, frothy, fractal boundaries in our mind? <laughs> well, this uh, relates to the idea of fractals, which I, maybe we shouldn't get too uh, deep into fractals because we'd probably lose all of our viewers <laughs> or listeners. But basically the idea is that there are repeating patterns in nature uh, that, that uh, repeat themselves when you go from large-scale objects down to teeny-weeny things. Uh, and uh, a certain fractal theorists have said this may give away, uh, this may provide a way of minds interacting with each other at a distance. Uh, I don't think I want to take it farther than that, except fractal theory, fractal, fractal based mathematics have been used by uh, uh, biologists and even physicists to try to uh, come up with a theory about how minds uh, unite and operate uh, in sync at a distance. I think I'll leave it at that. Perfect. All right. Well, let's let's go to something more fun. The the seventh sense and uh, maybe the hummingbird feeder outside your place. <laughs> well, I play a game with the hummingbirds uh, around here. You know, I try to get on the same uh, uh, the same vibe or the same uh, uh, wavelength with them and ask them to come in response to my thoughts. You know, this may be totally an illusion, and I've never carried out a scientific test of this, but it seems to me that we can communicate a, 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 in a certain way in terms of their coming uh, in response to my thoughts. Now, this may sound crazy, uh, but this essential uh, experiment has been replicated not in humans, but in other life forms, uh, particularly animals, uh, dogs, by Dr. Rupert Sheldrake in Britain, who has written a book about animals that know when their owners are returning. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody uh, has seen dogs go to the door and wag their tail and eagerly anticipate when their owners are going to show up. He has tested this when the owners are miles and miles away without any sensory connection at all. And when the owner begins to intend to come home, regardless of how far away he is, the animal goes to the door and anticipates uh, through his behaviors uh, the arrival of the, uh, the owner. There are videos of this. These have been replicated by other observers. It seems to me to be indirect evidence that we share some sort of knowing uh, with people other than humans. How about people staring at us and us knowing and taking and, and, and turning? <laughs> There's a rich uh, uh, experimental database now showing that uh, when people do stare at someone else, even through closed circuit television hookups, that the person who is on the receiving end of the stare has an increase in some sort of autonomic activity at the moment the person begins staring at him or her. This is uh, one of those uh, uh, instances that people can relate to, I think. Everybody has looked around at a restaurant and seen the person staring at them or uh, in lanes of traffic, looked over and their eyes meet. I mean, th this is extremely common phenomenon. Uh, so I think this is indirect evidence that maybe we do pick up through mechanisms that aren't fully explained on the thoughts uh, and intentions of other distant individuals. I'm particularly interested in the closed circuit television 
uh, uh, aspect of these studies because you can't fake that. Mm-hmm. Can you explain that in a little more detail? <laughs> well, uh, there have been any number of, uh, well, I'd say scores of repetitions of this setup. A, a person is in a room and uh, let's say across the campus uh, is another person. And the person, one of these people has a closed circuit television camera beaming the image back to the person who's going to do the staring. And so at randomized intervals, the person doing the staring will just stare at the closed circuit television image of the distant individual. And at that time, there are monitors looking at skin temperature, autonomic uh, conductivity of the skin, and that sort of thing. And and the uh, physiology of the distant person who's being televised begins to change at the moment the distant individual begins to stare at this individual's image on the screen. Uh, these are randomized trials. You can't fake it. These individuals don't know. The individual on the receiving end doesn't know when he or she is being stared at. And there's a correlation between the intentions of the starer mm-hmm. and the physiology of the person being stared at on the television screen. I love it. Let's, let's go from there to rats. <laughs> and, and how in the world did you rehabilitate your relationship with rats? There were these studies done where the rats are given a choice. Their, com- their, their, their comrade in arms is locked up and can't get out. And the rat yeah. is given a choice. Right. You can take it from there if you want. Or, well, the rats love chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> Who wouldn't? That's, that's, I know the smart rats, right? And so, the rat uh, is given a choice of freeing a fellow rat who's who's in a tube and can't get out, or he can uh, respond to the chocolate that's offered over here. And these rats are so empathic that uh, in spite of this innate drive to eat chocolate, the, the, rat, will, the rat will choose to uh, free his partner, and uh, they will both go eat the chocolate together. Uh, now, this blows your mind about how selfish you, you know, these animals are. They don't think. They don't have empathy and so on. But this uh, was an academic study that has been heralded as showing that animals as primitive primitive as rats have an inherent empathic compassionate place in their being if this wasn't so you would expect the rat just to go for the chocolate and to heck with the rat who's trapped in the tube but that doesn't uh, uh, happen uh, you know it looks like a human response a, di- a display of empathy and compassion and I don't know if you want to use the word love in describing oh, yeah. this. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> well, it's, it sounds, you know, you, you get, uh, people used to say, I don't know if everybody says it anymore, the only reason your dog or cat, quote, loves you so much is because you feed them. Yeah, right. And there's, there's this uh, chain of thought that, you know, uh, the uh, animals, our pets, our dogs and our cats are, uh, really training us uh, to feed them, and we're just uh, hooked on uh, doing that. So this is all stimulus response, and we don't need to get excited about things like empathy and caring and compassion. So I think these rat experiments really call that uh, view of uh, animals into question. I see no reason why we ought to confine things like empathy and compassion and love to human beings. I think the evidence for common consciousness, which I've tried to bring out in this book, sort of blows that idea out of the water. We do exchange feelings and uh, thoughts uh, with uh, not just other people, but with uh, animals, uh, even beyond our beloved pets, our dogs and cats. Uh, An example that impressed me, we talked about earlier, was the connection with the coyotes. Uh, I don't have any trouble thinking that we were on some sort of communal uh, wavelength going on there. So I hear Tina Turner in my head right now, and she's saying, what's love got to do with this? <laughs> well, I think Tina was, <laughs> was right on target. I, uh, if you look at these experiments in which people link up with each other via thoughts or emotions, feelings, and so on, 
it's almost always the case that there is some deep emotional component uh, in so many of these cases. Uh, for example, the twin, the identical twin connections at a distance. You don't see these in all twins. You see them in twins who enjoy being twins. Not all twins enjoy being twins. And if you unpack that, what that means is that there's a really strong, empathic, loving connection be the, between these two twins that share these thoughts and feelings at a distance. Uh, I see this in the healing experiments that I've looked at, mm -hmm. where one person uses intention and compassion to try to improve the biological state of a distant patient who may be in a coronary care unit or in some other medically critical situation. If you look at how healing operates between people, it is almost always the case that love, compassion, and empathy play a huge role in the response of the person who is in need. I've talked to dozens of healers who do this work, and if you ask them, well, how do you bring this about? How do you make this happen? Almost all of them will say, look, it, it goes beyond just sheer technique. It doesn't matter what words you use. You have to feel it in your heart. You really have to care for the person whom you're sending the empathy, the love, the compassion to. So, Michael, if you take the love away from a lot of these experiments, they don't work. So I, I think we're compelled to insert love into our understanding of these transactions between people, although I know that that causes a lot of intellectual indigestion for a lot of people. Well, there's, there's a, uh, a sign that you reference, I think it was one of the 26, chapter 27 to the book, about a hospital where these nurses, I think, came back from a conference, <laughs> and it said, and, and one of the head nurses had sniffed wind that these women had been, or not just women, these nurses had been at a healing conference, and it said, there was this sign that said, there will be no healing in this hospital. <laughs> That's exactly right. Actually, my wife is a skilled cardiovascular nursing scholar and an author, and she related this to me. I mean, this was on the, uh, a, a real event that happened in one of the major hospitals in the city where I was practicing, practicing internal medicine. Mm -hmm. Actually, there's a corollary story I sometimes uh, uh, relate. My wife has authored 20-something books in healing and in nursing, and she was asked to give a a major address at a at a nursing conference and then they found out that she was going to talk about healing uh and then they disinvited her and the letter said well we can't invite you yet so we're just going to have to defer your talk but when we get into healing we're going to invite you and we my wife and i had a big laugh at that and we said well what do you suppose they're into now if they're not into healing so, you know, people get nervous and really uh, anxious when we use these words uh, of healing and love and compassion and all of this. But frankly, if you take healing, compassion, and love away from the equations of healing, they just don't work. The experiments fall flat. Uh, patients have a terrible experience with their doctors when the transaction, doctor-patient relationship has no compassion. Actually, there was a survey several years ago looking at millions of hospitalized patients mm -hmm. uh, across the United States, uh, asking them about their experiences as a patient in the hospital. The most common response about what they would like to see inserted into their hospital experience was, guess what? More love, more compassion, and more feeling toward them from their healthcare practitioners. That makes sense. And in a minute, I want to dive into kind of what we can do as we start to understand. I don't even know if understand is the word because it's such a, <laughs> such a vast for lack of a, but, but before that, maybe you can talk about, I was fascinated. I, we've had uh, Dr. Eben Alexander on the show a couple times. I've had a couple of NDEs myself, nothing like what he's gone through. Um, but you talk about something that was really, really impressed upon me which is why we have cruelty in false hope backwards. We have doctors who say, I don't want to give you false hope that there's anything after now. That would be cruel. Well, I've been looking for evidence for false hope in medicine during my decades as an internist. I haven't found any false hope yet. Uh, I think you can convey hope 
with empathy and compassion and love and prevent it from having any aspect of falsity about it. I'm not sympathetic with people who uh, think they have to be uh, retiring and remote and cold toward their patients uh, out of fear of delivering false hope. I think that's insane. Uh, Patients can sense when compassion and love are being extended to them, and when they do not sense that, they do not heal well at all. Uh, So I think that uh, we need to restore empathy and compassion and love in the medical schools uh, if we're going to merit the, uh, the title of being a healer. Now, actually, this is not a far out suggestion. There are many medical schools now, top tier medical schools on the West Coast and the Northeast, who have introduced empathy training courses for medical students as they go through medical school. This is a tremendous issue in medical education now. There's called uh, an empathy gap, which medical students run into in their third year of medical school. And even though they will tell you that they went to medical school in the first place because of the the desire to help people Mm -hmm. to deliver empathic, compassionate care, something happens in the third year where this empathy seems to be drained away. No one has really figured out uh, what this is due to, probably a lot of the stress of just being a medical student. But the reason that empathy is being reinserted into the curriculum in many medical schools is because without it, patients do not do well. So there's no way for us to weenie out in medicine of acknowledging the importance of empathy and love and healing. What... What is consciousness are you getting from, you cite so many examples in here and, and also studies and uh, people like uh, Dean Ra- Radden, Raiden, we've had him on, I still can't pronounce his name right, sorry Dean. Dean Radden? Uh-huh. Yes, Dean Radden, about life after life. Well, it's interesting you bring this up because just this morning I had a phone call conversation with Dean Radden and uh, <laughs> Uh, we talked about some of these issues. Uh, the life after life issue uh, is should be a part of the national conversation uh, in our culture. The reason is that by now, 15 million Americans say that they have had a near-death experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, the most common description of what this is like for people who come back and tell us about this is that during this experience they felt united with all there is. They felt no separation, they felt uh, a deep sense of connectivity with all of creation, the universe at large, and so on. Uh, I know Dr. Yabin Alexander, he's a dear friend of mine, and we've talked about these issues and he affirms that this was the thing that really he brought back more than any other sense Uh, any other emotion, this inseparability in the dimensions of consciousness with other people, with all of creation. Now, if you look at the implications of all of these studies where people at a distance and even outside the present gain information, I think that this tells us that we've been on the wrong track about life after death, immortality, and so on. What we know is that the emerging image of consciousness is going to be one that is non-local. Individual minds are not confined or localized to the brain, the body, or even to the present moment. If we think this true, if we think this through and imagine the implications of a non-local consciousness, if something is non-local in space, it's everywhere in space, If it's non-local with respect to time, it's everywhere in time. And having said that, we've reinvented this idea of immortality and the soul. I think this idea needs to be inserted into our knowledge of human beings. It needs to be put first and foremost in medical school curriculum. If we did that, this would serve as a great cure for the greatest disease that humans have ever experienced, which is the fear of annihilation total demolition of all that you are with physical death. 
this is the most compassionate thing I think we could do in science, to give people hope beyond the death of the body. This is not a theological or a spiritual or religious issue only. This is a, an extension of the implications of actual experiments now in the thousands that show that we're non-local creatures with respect to consciousness. That's where we need to head. And if I may say so, Please. not doing so is going to be brutal, maybe lethal, for not just our ideas about who we are, but the earth itself. I believe that if we had an idea that we extend beyond this physical being, mm -hmm. if we are immortal, then this would do a lot to inhibit this epidemic of greed and selfishness, this get it while you can, enjoy it while you're here because you can't take it with you uh, idea that really poisons our environmental uh, enthusiasm these days. And I'll read you uh, a little comment from two consciousness researchers and one physicist who have written a book called The Non-Local Universe. Mm -hmm. a, a profound sense of identification with the other that operates at the deepest levels of our emotional lives is necessary if we are to deal with the ecological challenges we face. So we're not talking about just saving our own skins here. We're talking about saving the environment, the only home we have in the process. So I think that our concerns about our own fate are not just about human beings. It's about the earth itself. So there are double issues here uh, when we talk about non-locality uh, that uh, I think we're living into. We will come out with this image of non-local non consciousness in the end. But I sense urgency here. You know, time is not on our side. And there are people out there who want to demonize the other and uh, call global, con global climate change the collective conspiracy and fraud and hoax perpetrated by thousands of scientists out there. I think we need to be talking about the fate not only of our own consciousness, but about the fate of the environment itself, which I view as connected. I couldn't agree more. As, as above, so below, and as the ecology goes outside of us, so goes the ecology inside of us. That's beautifully put. No, I'm not sure I can steal credit for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> if one, you know, Michael, if one, if minds are united, there's no such thing as originality anyway. So uh, we'll point. forgive you. <laughs> Touche. In talking about this, and I want to bring it home in this last little little bit of time, and, and I, I wish we had a lot more time. Everybody, you're going to want to get the book, One Mind. Just go out and get it. And the story after story after example after example, it's, <laughs> it's going to blow your one mind. Um, there. Um, when we talk about saving, saving the planet, saving ourselves, the word saving almost gets into tree hugger and I am a tree hugger but it sounds too weak but when we but when we when we start going down this rabbit hole there's a part of the challenge part of the danger is separation is thinking we are separate from everyone else and the corollary to that is no matter how much I do it's not even a drop in the bucket right well this is where the sensation of the one mind and the intellectual appreciation of the one mind come together to change the way we look at how things can turn out. No one of us is capable of saving much of anything. And the reason we say that is we sense ourselves as isolated individual units. I'm one unit in seven billion on this planet. What the heck can I do? Uh, statistically, I cannot make a difference. If we had a different uh, way of thinking about our relationship with one another, we become not just one cog in the machine, we become seven billion unitary uh, entities capable of doing whatever we collectively decide to do. This idea of the one mind is a way of empowering people 
to make a difference, not just in their individual uh, existence, but collectively. And I think that this is one of the most stunning contributions this idea of the one mind makes to human welfare. Uh, the other major contribution it makes, I think, uh, is the notion of immortality. So I think that our fate largely depends on the degree which we permit these one mind ideas to percolate through our individual minds and consciousnesses, coming out with the idea that the idea of the individual is pretty much an illusion. We can stick with that if we want to. We do need a sense of personhood. We don't want to give that up. But that's only one side of the coin. The other side is the complementary idea of our connectivity, our unity. If we really sense that, we can do anything we choose. Astronaut Edgar Mitchell and how his views of the world were changed when he was out there. Yep. Well, astronaut uh, Edgar Mitchell was, I believe, the sixth man to walk on the uh, surface of the moon. Uh, he uh, is a hero of mine. And uh, he had a transformative experience coming back uh, from the moon. Uh, and uh, he wrote about this extensively. It actually changed his uh, worldview and how he comported himself in his life. He saw the earth from far away as the most beautiful thing he had ever witnessed in his life. From, out in, from in outer space, he could not see any boundaries. There were no dividing lines between uh, countries. Uh, he couldn't see any, uh, anything except the earth as a whole. And he went on to talk with other astronauts and cosmonauts and a surprising number of them had the, the same sort of feeling. It so influenced Ed Mitchell that when he got back, he thought he had to do something to help people be, begin to be aware of this oneness, unity, connectivity, and inseparability between everything on Earth. In order to do that, he founded IONS, the Institute of Noetic Sciences, which to this day is one of the greatest laboratories doing experiments confirming this one mind idea. Well, I, th this is such a... Uh, spectacular transformation in uh, people's lives when they see Earth from, uh, from outer space. I thought that it ought to be a requirement for people running for important office to take a journey out into space to get a, do <laughs> a dose of this idea that we're all connected. Uh, hopefully going beyond this idea of the enemy and the other uh, and, and so on. I, I often think of and reference uh, Carl Sagan's uh, pale blue dot of, yes. of what we looked from, from, I think it was Voyager, from the edge of the universe. We're all just part of this one dot. That's it. We are all one. Oh, I totally agree. You know, maybe when space uh, travel uh, becomes uh, uh, more uh, financially uh, viable, we'll send our presidential candidates <laughs> out for, <laughs> for a little trip into into outer space and hope that they uh, come back uh, changed as well. All, all right. So on that note, let's do a story towards the end. Gandhi and a gentleman who came up to him um, having to do with, well, Gandhi, I guess, is, is starving to death at this point for peace and a gentleman who came up to him. Well, Gandhi we, uh, gave a, a press conference. Uh, uh, this was back in the uh, 40s. And uh, a brass young reporter came up uh, and said, uh, Mr. Gandhi, what do you think about Western civilization? And without missing a beat, he said, I think it would be an excellent idea. <laughs> and Gandhi was one of these individuals who had this idea of the one mind. His being, his worldview was permeated with the idea of the one mind. And he embodied compassion and empathy, I think, as deeply as any politician we've seen. Uh, so I think that uh, this was a message that it is possible to go beyond this idea of the other, the individual uh, uh, country that has even enslaved your, your own country. If Gandhi could get beyond that and display compassion and empathy toward the British Empire, I think that uh, there's hope for practically anyone. He remains a great role model for the embodiment of the one mind. Thank you, thank you, thank you. How do we, how do we take this, 
growing understanding in us. You've helped plant some seeds today, and hopefully people are going to water these seeds. And, and, and as, as the, the, the Buddha said many times, check it, test it on your own, you know, see if it has any validity to it. What does this mean, or how can this help enrich our lives here today or in this present moment? Well, I think one of the main mistakes that we make is that we try too hard. You know, we want, you know, four prescriptions, four prescriptive steps that we can uh, engage in to make the one mind really pop in our life. Uh, I think that's uh, usually an unfruitful approach. Mm -hmm. Uh, I am attracted to the the four rules of uh, life that uh, were popularized by uh, a friend of mine recently, uh, Angie Arian, she said, the first thing to do in your life is just show up. The second was pay attention. The third was tell the truth. And the fourth rule of life is just don't be attached to results. That just seems like doing nothing to so many people. But if you unpack what's contained in that, you, you'll go beyond the idea that this idea of oneness and connectivity is something you've got to manufacture Mm -hmm. or somehow produce because you don't have it now. Everybody is suffused with this idea of unity. If we get our minds out of the way, there are millions of examples in everyday experience where this one mind unity connected to this stuff becomes real for us. You mentioned one common trivial example is when, you know, you know a phone's going to ring and who's on the other end before it happens. I mean, if we unpack our lives, we can see millions of ways that this idea of one is manifest. The idea is how can we set the stage for these things to happen? There are a million ways. One of my favorite is exposure to nature. And uh, my wife and live, and I live on the side of a mountain and mm-hmm. uh, outside of Santa Fe. We just go out and we just be. We take hikes in nature. We go out in wilderness and camp out for two weeks every summer. And we just let things happen to us. We don't try to unite with everything. And if you just get your conscious mind out of the way, this can happen automatically. So I would say don't try too hard. It's just a a sensation waiting to happen. And if you will just simply engage in activities that get your consciousness out of the way and let your unconscious wisdom bubble up to the surface, you don't have to worry (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> so from there, uh, Jessica, my wife, she's the producer of the show. She always likes me to ask a question about parents and kids. And so as we're, we're starting to understand this and learn about one mind, what does this mean for parents and teaching their kids? Well, I think uh, children, particularly young children, can be uh, great teachers here. You know, there's this idea of the old soul, the child who is born with this awareness, doesn't have to be taught it, uh, but it just expresses itself in their behavior of these children. Unfortunately, we don't do a good job of preserving that. Uh, We do what we can to help kids unlearn that and become individuals and develop a strong sense of self. I think uh, we need to honor the the fact that most children come into this uh, life with this as an inherent part of their being and uh the challenge for parents is how to help them preserve that before we wrap things up uh, a question we like to ask all of our guests just before the end is what personally brings you the greatest happiness or what i call the woohoo factor (laughs) well it's usually spontaneous uh i allow in my life the possibility that these things happen on their own they have a dynamic on their own and i don't try to make these aha moments or epiphanies happen, they have an ecology of their own. And I just hope that I can be in a place spiritually, intellectually, morally, ethically, uh, where these things can happen. Uh, I don't have a way of doing that. I think the idea is to get out of the way and let these things uh, happen on their own. We don't have to manufacture joy and fulfillment in our life if we can just stop inhibiting these things from happening so i that's my feeling about how to have a whoopee experience i would i have them often by the way (laughs) uh, (laughs) and uh uh i know i'm on the right track when these things happen frequently and when i have a dry spell Mm -hmm. uh 
sort of like Houston Smith calls the spiritual flu. You know, you catch the spiritual flu and you feel dry and inhibited and all this. Or the idea is to do what you can to get over it quickly. And uh, so it's a game of cat and mouse. Nobody is perfect all the time. But uh, there are ways that we can encourage this sort of thing, but not through muscular uh, activity and certainly not by depending on the overly depending on the intellect. If I'm out running and uh, I tend to do all my runs in nature, try to quiet the mind, and I trip, it tends to mean that I'm thinking too much. I'm catching the trippy flu. And so <laughs> the answer is I have to ground myself to, to, and stop thinking, to just be. Is yeah. that the answer for the spiritual flu? Well, I think it's one way to do it. I think exposure to great beauty is one of the real ways of opening ourselves to this one mind awareness. For some people like you, uh, great beauty uh, is through physical exercise, running, exposure to nature, and so on. Other people might uh, get in the groove by listening to great music. For some people, it's great art. But if you unpack those things, exposure to great beauty I think it's just a common denominator. So one thing is that we need to make our world more beautiful. This is a tie-in to the environmental uh, movement again. And it's also a tie-in to visions and, and uh, uh, sensations, realizations of other people who have gone before. May I close with a poem? Love the poem. Let's do this. Well, this is from Hafiz, who is a 14th century Persian poet. And this is a one-mind manifesto, if ever there was one. He said, let's go deeper, go deeper. For if we do, our spirits will embrace and interweave. Our union will be so glorious that even God will not be able to tell us apart. Whoopee. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't. Thank you enough, Larry, for being on the show. Everyone, well, where can you go? Actually, we need, we need to ask, where can people go to get One Mind and to find your beautiful work? Well, my website is larrydossymd.com, and you can order off the Internet and all the usual sites a copy of the book. Fantastic. And if you didn't catch that, go on over to inspirenationshow.com, and we'll get you over to Larry as well. Can't thank you enough for being on the show, Larry. <laughs> For everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get one mind, and tap into the oneness, and shine bright. Woohoo! Woohoo! Ooh, that's got a little coyote to it. <laughs> That'd be a woo woo woo. Yeah, no, get it. Yeah. <laughs> well, they sing to us at night here. You know, we're they they love the surrounding space here and they serenade us at night so i guess we're going to have to start howling back at them oh i like it i like it when i when I, when we got pumpkin or i guess it was when i it was before i met my wife it was actually three of them that i rescued they were starving to death and i couldn't uh, I, I their mama had been starving to death and uh so for a few years before uh two of them went to a very good home i had three coyotes raising me <laughs> oh well well, so, well you, you do not beautiful. raise three coyotes. <laughs> uh, no, really. But they are. You're great, Michael. Thank you, Larry. This is beautiful. You really beautiful. do it. I mean, nobody does this better than you do. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Let me know if there's ever anything we can do to help on our side of things. We support you so much. We are. We're obviously in this with you. We're all in this with you. Thank you. Blessings. Hi everyone. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're going to get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, inspirenationshow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright.